Um, okay, so today we're gonna continue our discussion of um, path integrals um, with the interesting part, which is interactions. So we're gonna talk about interactions in path integrals and Feynman rules. Uh, this this part onward is going to be calculation heavy, and I recommend that you guys uh, keep track of you have you will have to do on this side uh, some calculations to keep track of it. There's no choice for me but just going through these integrals and expressions fast. All right, good. So a review. Uh, in lecture 18, uh, what we talked about were we we continued our discussion of path integrals in quantum mechanics. We talked about path integrals for correlation functions because up until then, we were talking about path integrals for uh, amplitudes to go from some initial qi ti at some time ti configuration to some other, some later ket uh, bra qf at time tf, right? Then we said that if you add a small imaginary time to the initial and final time, because this gives an imaginary piece to the Hamiltonian, so e to the power of i t h will become e to minus epsilon h. And as epsilon h t, and as you take t to infinity, this projects to the vacuum. Oops. Whoops. This projects to the vacuum. And that is crucial because using this trick, we could calculate correlation functions in the interacting vacuum, right? So you could use, we wrote the path integral we use the path integral after this trick, imaginary time, to write uh, correlation functions. So this is the expression for correlation function. What pops out of the path integral is a time ordered correlation function. That's beautiful. That's very good because that has a very nice. That's a convenient for that's convenient for physics. And then of course you will have to always normalize because the connection between path integrals and um, the, what once we include this trick. There is this extra coefficient that pops out and you will have to normalize by dividing this way, right? So this was a th trick that we used. Th this actually completed this promise that path integral quantization is a full reformulation of quantum mechanics because it can calculate not only the amplitudes but also all the correlation functions. And already you saw here a nice connection between correlation functions and uh, amplitudes, but we're we're gonna the, 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 this connection is a little bit it goes deeper. All right. Then we talked about path integrals for classical partition function. This so this is the classical quantum correspondence. This is uh, we have a classical theory at finite temperature. In statistical physics, we have a partition function. It's a function of beta, and you can write this down as a path integral trace of e to minus b h as a path integral. In where there is this imaginary time, which is periodically identified with period beta h bar, right? And the, this 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 whole thing works out really nicely because of the analogy between Schrodinger equation and the heat equation under the weak uh, weak contraction t going to minus i tau. So in comparison, here you get a path integral over this manifold with a periodically identified uh, Euclidean time. But the, the pre period is beta h bar. And what, what is important here is that you have the Euclidean Lagrangian here, right? So Euclidean or Lagrangian will have a sign flipped in this kinetic term. That, that's important. That ensures um, the convergence of the path integral in a very, very nice way. All right. Then we talked about path integrals for scalar field theory. In going from quantum mechanics to QFT, we had in quantum mechanics, we have the Q hat and P hat uh, position and momentum uh, very, uh, operators, and they become the field operator and the momentum conjugate operator, conjugate to a field, right? So for the case of scalar field, hopefully you remember it was the conjugate momentum was del T phi. For the case of fermions, because they were first order, this was psi and this was psi dagger, right? So that was some sort of like an interesting uh, thing that we had to, when we impose the canonical quantization and anti-commutation relations, we'll have to write them down in terms of the anti-commutator psi and psi dagger. All right, then we took the propagator 
and uh, in, in quantum field theory and wrote it as a path integral. Of course, as usual, the path integral is a path integral on the phase space. So you're path integrating over field configurations on the phase space, right? And here, here's your integral, and you have the uh, boundary conditions, right? The initial boundary condition and the final boundary conditions. These are correspond. This correspond to QI, the quantum field theory version of QI and QF. Um, and then, if the Hamiltonian is quadratic in uh, in the conjugate momentum, which we often assume it to be the case because we take our uh, Lagrange interaction terms to be only a function of the field, and it's not not it's the conjugate. So that's an assumption. It need not be true in some theories of interest, but if it is true, you could explicitly perform the Euclidean path, sorry, the, the path integral on the uh, momentum variables as we did in quantum mechanics, and you obtain a path integral in real space on over only field configurations. Good. Any questions so far? All right. Then we introduce the concept of generating functional, which for path integral is an analogy with uh, an analogy with um, statistical physics. This is the real time analog of the partition function. It's defined as, of course, it's a Lorentzian path integral. There's an I here, right? And then it's, it's defined by shifting the action by introducing a source. So it's, uh, so you couple the field to a source. And this source is like uh, in the case of in, in the other case was like uh, the, the role of that was uh, so the, the job of this guy is to introduce a variable parameter here, right? In the case of um, finite temperature, this was not uh, this was not it was just a parameter, right? Here, what we were finding is that we make the space time dependent. The the thing that's really nice about this this generating functional, of course. Like any other generating functional, the, its raison d'etre, its reason for living, is that you take derivatives of it with respect to j and set the results, set j equals zero at the end to calculate correlation functions. So um, why the reason we introduce this is that this generating functional in the free theory, we could write it down, solve it explicitly very elegantly. And it's a super convenient way of calculating these things. So the free action, we is always convenient in path integral forms to uh, path integrals to write them in this form using just uh, an integration by parts. Is this is this form clear? What I've done? It's just an integration by parts to turn del mu phi del mu phi to flip one of the del mu's, put one of the del mu's in the middle, right? And then this is like equations of motion looking. This i epsilon is an anticipation for this. Uh, Feynman um, propagator. I, ha I have introduced this I, I epsilon. Hopefully I, we argued for this and it's uh, clear for you guys what the origin of it. So we we can we can we compute this uh, partition function, this generating functional explicitly. The label zero here, it means that this is a free theory. Uh, calculation. So it's Gaussian. That's why we can do it. And the result, not surprisingly, is also Gaussian. So it becomes just like some constant. It's an overall normalization. It's irrelevant to the calculation of correlation functions because we're going to take derivatives with respect to J. This drops out, right? So it's, it's just it's an overall constant that just gets canceled out. Um, then the, the point is that here, the um, your, your generating functional effectively is just an exponent, exponential of two sources and a Feynman propagator that propagates in between them. We use this uh, notation, this diagrammatic notation, right? J, J delta F, right? And this is just to for you guys to become, uh, uh, to, to build towards Feynman diagrams that we're gonna discuss today in more depth. Then we wrote down, oops, we wrote down uh, the endpoint correlation functions, time ordered ones, of course, as uh, nth derivatives of the partition function. So over there, I think in my on my slides I had one expression that I didn't explain. I um, when we're writing the the um, in some of the expressions, I just put this up here and wrote it as log. So I didn't explain that 
that if, if you put this up here, that is the that gives you the connected correlation function. So just to make sure that I'm not confusing you guys at all, this is the definition we're going to be working with, and I'm going to define the connected correlator later in this lecture, right? So this is the expression we're going to be working uh, with, and then I'll define the connected correlator. Good. Then we talked about the free theory correlators, um, the two-point function, just by taking two derivatives of this explicit expression, is found to be just a Feynman propagator, um, right? Oh, oops. Here, there are no, <laughs> um, a two-point function is just this, because I'm setting all the, uh... <laughs> so then for the four-point function, we found uh, three terms, which have to do with three uh, possible contractions of uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, and then we saw that all the odd point functions are zero, right? It's just a result of the fact that if you have a Gaussian, which is J squared, you take a derivative, an odd number of derivatives, and then the resulting, uh, all the resulting terms that you generate will have um, an odd number, of, uh, will have j's in them. Therefore, once you set j equals zero, it will kill everything. Then we said that there is an operative version of this fact uh, using the fact that your, your, your full part uh, generating functional is Gaussian. And this is called Wick's theorem. So the time ordered operator as an operator could be written in terms of the uh, normal ordered. Recall what the normal ordered was. Normal order is when the, all the A's are, all the annihilation operators are on the, to the right of the creation operators. And, you know, like this is just a straightforward thing that actually I will include in a homework. Uh, yeah, okay. Any questions? So this is a review of the last lecture to just orient ourselves where we stand with our discussion of path intervals. Okay, so what are we gonna do today? Today we're just gonna, so this is a free theory, it's sort of boring. Uh, we solved it completely. It was all Gaussian. We solved it completely. We know all the correlation function. We wrote the Wick contraction, Wick, Wick's theorem. Everything about it is known. Now we are interested in interactions, right? So I'm going to split the discussion today into two parts. Part one is I'm not assuming small coupling. I'm not doing perturbation theory. Is non-perturbative. Now, there is a catch to this. Um, then there is a second part where I'm actually going to do perturbation theory. So in the first part, the punchline is going to be what we're going to derive is something called Schrodinger-Dyson equation. Schrodinger-Dyson equation formally defines as an infinite set of equations that will calculate for you all the correlation functions, formally. It's impossible to solve this. As a matter of fact, mathematically, these equations are a little bit ill-posed because they involve all sorts of divergent terms. But the point about Schrodinger-Dyson is that it's, it, it is really help, if you grasp it, it really helps you orient yourself in perturbation theory. So that's why I'm gonna go through most, most discussions of quantum field here at this level, skip Schrodinger-Dyson. But the, what's, what's very nice about Schrodinger-Dyson is that you see the notion of equations of motion come into play. And it also helps you later on understand what it means to talk about quantizing the theory on different backgrounds. So we're gonna discuss go through this discussion quickly and then turn on perturbation theory and do the perturbation theory. But I want you guys to have seen uh, Schrodinger-Dyson. Let us let me just, before even jumping into Schrodinger-Dyson, remind you what the store, where, where the starting point is. The starting point of Schrodinger-Dyson is this discussion we had in uh, earlier in path integrals, two, two lectures ago, when we said in classical physics, 
equations of motions are extremization of the action. So del S del phi is equal to zero. Then we discuss this del S del phi is an operator in quantum mechanics and it's non-zero, right? So we multiply the operator by some F and then we showed that once we put this inside expectation values, right? It picks up derivatives of F with respect to phi. So that is going to be the core idea behind uh, Schrodinger Dyson. And if you recall, the derivation of that relied on the fact that in the path interval, field is a dummy variable. You integrate over it. So you could arbitrarily redefine your integration parameter field. That's a, that's a deep concept in physics. We're going to do that when we do renormalization. So this showing your Dyson will help you understand formally what, how renormalization works. Um, it will help you organize your mind, like uh, when we're discussing perturbation theory. There are very formal equations, but they're super useful. The idea, the key idea, I repeat, is the fact that if you have integral of d of x, f of x, a reparameterization of x is just uh, x is a dummy variable. You can reparameterize it to perform the integral using a different variable. In a path integral, fields variables are also dummy variables because you're path integrating over them. So you could arbitrarily redefine them. Now, these redefinitions of the field variables are the origin of a lot of funky things in physics, such as dualities, blah, blah, blah. All right. So enough, enough abstract talk. So here is a generating functional and um, using the rules that we've been discussing so far, uh, I said that we could write this down in terms of the path integral, right? So here's the path integral over phi. Here is the free theory action. And we're gonna, today we're gonna stick to a uh, scalar field, right? Scalar field. And then I'm gonna add some sort of interaction term here, right? And then of course there will be source, I think today I decided to uh, put capital J for source. Um, I was using little j for source before. Um, and then you will have to normalize this way, right? But now these terms are added. Is this, is this familiar? This is just a definition, right? Okay. Now, what is neat is that you realize that this, roughly speaking, could be interpreted as the norm of the vacuum in the interacting theory. So this whole thing could be interpreted as this is the vacuum of the interacting theory, and this is the time ordered E2 ij phi. So if you recall, um, in the case of a free theory, we wrote this down and this was the vacuum of the free theory, and there's an expression similarly here. But this is very formal. This is a very, very formal. The, a lot of these steps that I'm <laughs> going through will fall apart if you want to make them mathematically rigorous before doing renormalization. So there is a way of implementing renormalization in this whole story to make it mathematically rigorous, but we're gonna avoid that because if you try to do everything at the same time, you're just gonna get confused, all right? Okay, so now here's a very first trick. Recall, recall the you the use of this um, generating functional was that if you took derivatives with respect to j and set j equals zero, it would give you uh, correlation functions. So I can think of this zj. I can, in my head, formally expand this in a power series in j, and the coefficient of the m's power is just the correlation function. Right? It's just this expression is built. So that you take derivatives with respect to j and set j equals zero and read off the correlation. This is a very formal expression. I'm not saying anything about the convergence of this blob, the, this uh, sum. That's a very formal thing. But intuitively, if you want to think about it, this is this says that this um, this guy properly normalized. So here I'm going to be a little bit sloppy with normalization. This generating functional. There's a piece that's one. There is a piece that is the one point function attached to a source. There is a piece that's two point function attached to two sources. There's a piece that three point function attached to three sources plus blah, blah, blah. I'm suppressing all the uh, 
the combinatorial factor, like one over two factor or one over three factor was blah, blah, blah. All right, so this is a cartoon to think about what we're trying to calculate. Now, here comes the Schrodinger dyson equation. This is the key idea we started with. We, inside the path integral, we put del s del phi, and then we completed this del s del phi. We wrote this as del s del phi of f s minus um, s, uh, what did we write? Yeah, minus um, this, del f del phi s, right? And then we saw that, of course, this term integrated over here, the similar to the whatever is called the first uh, fundamental thing in calculus. It's just a change of variable, right? So this will, if you don't have, if because in, in these calculations, past integral, we've taken boundaries to infinity. This is just an, by integration by parts, this term just vanishes. And the interpretation is literally change of variables. This is what we did before, we went through it, right? So as an example, choose your f of phi to be e to the power of i j x y x because you're anticipating this expression, right? Okay, so what do we find? Well, this is the expression we find, integral of e to the power of i s phi. This is the full interacting action, okay? I'm not doing any perturbation to you at this point. e to the power of i integral j x phi x, del s del phi plus j. This j is just this term. Good. So this has a name. This equation already has a name. This already should could be called Schrodinger Dyson, right? But you usually call this Schrodinger Dyson in the case that we've picked f to be this. Now I'm going to massage it further. Because this is a function of phi, right? I can think of the function of phi. So this, this is a function of phi. It's like some sort of expect correlation function looking thing. So I can rewrite this term as a bunch of derivatives with respect to i del j. So for example, if your s interaction term is phi four, this term will be phi cube. Now phi cube is inside the path integral. It's a time order three point function. I can view it as taking three derivatives with respect to i j of z j. So this equation could be repackaged as a differential equation. Let me pause here. Is that is that clear? I'm going to work out the examples. So this is called Schrodinger Dyson, the differential form of the, uh, the differential form of the Schrodinger Dyson equation. It's fully non-perturbative. I haven't said anything. It's just a consistency condition for our z of j. Now let's do some examples. Sim Schrodinger Dyson simplifies calculations quite a lot. Here's an example. Take the free action, the Turk action to have a free part plus some sort of interaction bit, right? So if you, this is something you're going to go through in a homework problem, but you basically derive this, oops, you basically derive this and you go from here to here and you obtain this equation. So del s del phi, there will be a term which is this, right? So there, once you take del s del phi, you're going to pick this term. And you're going to take, pick up V prime term. Good. Now, this term plus V prime term, you have to stick it inside the path integral, right? Plus J has to be equal to zero. This is some sort of correlation function. So I can write it as a bunch of derivatives, right? So there's this is the first one point function. So I'm just going to put I del I, uh, I uh, del J. And whatever is this guy is like a third point function, four point function. I'm just going to call it V prime of interaction del I del J minus J. This has to be zero. Now, set J equals zero, you're going to get the first equation showing your Dyson equation. Set, taking a whole bunch of derivatives and setting J equals zero, term by term will solve quantum field theory for you non-perturbatively in principle. 
It's not going to happen in reality, right? So, but it's super intuitive and it's super conceptually helpful to think about this. Setting j equals zero on the first term will give you this equation. First derivative of j with respect to zj will give you a one-point function. This is just the uh, uh, equations of motion acting on a one-point function. And this is just v prime of interaction. This says that in an interacting theory, the one-point function is related to the extrema of the potential. This is this is about v prime, right? Uh, yeah. At some point in the second part of the course, we're going to talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking, Higgs mass, all of that. That's when fields obtain one point functions. Uh, so the one point function is when you have some sort of a background uh, background value for the field. And that comes from over there, we're going to say that we'll see that it's going to come from extremization of the action. But here is the first hint that it will be related. Taking a bunch of derivatives back to del del j, I'm setting j equals zero, will give you extra equations. So if you do that, the second equation you obtain is this. The differential equation is uh, the, the equation Klein-Gordon operator acting on the propagator two-point function plus time order phi v prime is equal to this. I'm just suppressing the, the fact that these are like d plus one dimensional um, Dirac multiple functions. So I absolutely invite you guys to think about the meaning of this equation, but I'm gonna tell you the meaning, but you have to think about it and fill in the steps. The meaning of this equation is, this is the closest we get in quantum field theory to saying that phi hat satisfies classical equations of motion. So just a hint, what is a propagator? Propagator is a two-point function time ordered. The time ordered bit is some step function. When this acts on it, we'll give you this. The other term is related to this. That's what I'll say, but do think about it, okay? Let's work out examples. Take, today we're gonna talk about lambda phi four theory. So this is the case where we have a scalar field and we take the action to be lambda over, this four factorial is some sort of convenient combinatorical, combinatoric factor. It gets rid of a lot of twos and threes. Um, phi to power four. So this is the first um, schrodinger Dyson equation saying that the one point function is related to the three point function on the same points. So this is the very first appearance of the fact that these equations are horribly L behaved and they're going, to, they're going to be hard to make rigorous, but we, we can make them rigorous, but we're not going to discuss that here. And then the two point function will give you the Dirac delta function and then four point function with this X at same point. So at the moment it might look wacky, but this is actually how we do Feynman diagram perturbation theory. So when you do these, draw these Feynman diagrams, what you're doing in real space is actually doing these, calculating these silly things. And that's why all there are all sorts of infinities all over the place. So of course, the, this discussion of Schrodinger Dyson is very quick that I'm going through, but I absolutely encourage you guys to go through this step-by-step step slowly to grasp it. All right. <clears throat> now, th these equations are differential equations, dif the differential form of the Schrodinger Dyson. There is a way to write down an integral form. This is something that we're going to do in your homework. It's just straightforward. There's an integrated version. And I'm just going to show it to you guys, but you're going to derive it in your uh, homework. The integrated Schrodinger Dyson gives you a set of equations. On the left-hand side, you have m plus one point function. So in, I'm talking about the lambda phi four case, for example. On the right side, you have m minus one point and m plus three point, point correlators. So these are equations that will hierarchically relate all the higher point function to lower point functions. So in principle, in some simple, super simple, weird integrable theory, 
you might be able to solve these equations. And if you solve these equations, you've solved the theory. You know everything about it. If you ever, if ever, anyone ever comes to you and says, is quantum field theory a set of differential equations? The answer is yes. Here it is, it's an infinite set of them. Actually, these are not differential equations. <laughs> these are actually uh, integral equations. There are the, 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 up, the differential form is the one, what we're discussing about, right? So it's an integral set of, uh, it's an infinite set of integral equations. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about showing your Dyson. And we're gonna move on. But keeping these forms in mind is important, these forms in mind, because once we start doing Feynman diagram perturbation theory, you're gonna see all of these terms come pop one by one. We're never gonna solve these equations in this course ever. But what we're gonna do is that we're gonna assume that G endpoint function could be expanded in the as in power series of the coupling. And then plug this power series inside this. Sorry, we're not gonna do this, but what we do is equivalent to this. This plugging this power series inside this and solving these equations order by order in perturbation theory. Feynman diagrams are, are, are equivalent to plugging this ex series expansion inside this and expanding it order by order in perturbation theory. Okay. Now, to those of you guys who are math oriented, I should comment that this perturbation theory is always asymptotic. This is an asymptotic perturbation theory, which means that it's only the cal that as as you go to higher, it's not convergent. As you go to higher and higher terms, there is an order of p where instead of it converging, it starts growing and going back up. Now, if you ever worry about the how to make perturbation theory rigorous, there is a belief, rather belief that's supported by some physics which is perturbation theory as an asymptotic expansion is Borel summable. I will not say anything beyond that. So there is a beautiful discussion of what does perturbation theory mean mathematically, how to make it rigorous, and it's tied to some of the unsolved problems of quantum fields here, but there's a lot of magic going on here. That's all I'm gonna say. Any questions before we actually do come back to earth and do perturbative calculations? All right, so now let's do perturbative. Actually, let me pause along here. Any questions here? Everything I said here is true about path intervals. You can do perturbation theory in path integrals. You can write down Freeman Dyson for, uh, sorry, for, for quantum mechanics. It's true for path integrals, including quantum mechanics. Everything I said here, these Schrodinger Dyson type equations also hold in, path, in quantum mechanics. So I invite you guys to think about this setup, these equations in the case of quantum mechanics. They are a lot easier to grasp and they are fundamental. So if you ever want to play around and learn something about non-perturbative aspects of quantum field theory, here's a good place to start. Yep. Uh, I had a quick question. Um, when we talk about these perturbative expansions diverging, because um, in, in like regular quantum mechanic perturbation theory, you can also get perturbation, perturbative expansions diverging. Like, like the, uh, I think it's the Stark effect, I think diverges, but that's because the, the bound state you're calculating isn't actually bound. It's just a pseudo bound resonance. Is there like any kind of similar interpretation? It's literally that here. Okay. It's literally that. So you get an asymptotic convergent series because not you're expanding around the false vacuum. You the, the the saddle point you thought was the saddle. Well, there are other saddles in your problem that are considered to be non perturbative contributions, and those. Non if you expand around those saddles, there will be a lot of cancellations between these terms. You just ignore all of those. That's why things diverge. Beautiful point. Yeah, this is 
it's a lot easier to wrap your head around the quantum mechanical case. This is no different. Quantum field theory is just the same principle applied to functional integration. Locality is built in. That's it. All right. Let's do um, actual perturbation theory. So what we're going to do is we're going to take Schrodinger Dyson equations and do perturbative expansion. So our action, oops, our action is some free part that I've written a million times, right? This is a free action for scalar field. And then there's some sort of interaction term that's like this. And this was our Schrodinger Dyson equation that we're dealing with, right? So we're gonna work this out in your homework, um, but there's a very formal solution for this equation. The solution is this, some constant e to the power of i s integral uh, interacting of del i del j z naught. So this is a non, uh, non, this is a free, this is a free uh, case, a answer, right? So this expression relates the generating functional of the interacting theory to the generating functional of the free theory. Now we worked out explicitly the generating functional of the free theory in the last lecture. So here formally, I just wrote down a beautiful expression for you that will be the basis of perturbation theory, uh, Feynman diagram of perturbation theory. So the connection between what we're, we're just discussing earlier now and perturbation theory is all about this. Right, so you write the generating functional in terms of the generating functional of the free theory acted upon by this. This formally solved this equation. All right, that's something we're going to check in your homework. But in other words, usually most textbooks don't don't tell you the details of that. They will just write this equation. They would say zj, which is a generating functional for for in the presence of source divided by generating functional in the absence of source is just supposed to be this correlation function. Right, this is the interacting vacuum. Now, you can expand this in terms of the, you can write it in terms of the free vacuum by taking e to minus i integral v phi out. Let me pause here and ask for questions because this step follows from this equation. You haven't worked it out. Let's stare at this and see if this makes sense to you guys. Think about it this way. This is, um, uh, this is like the normalization of the interacting vacuum, like, right? Because the interacting vacuum, if you're calculating the norm of it, is just a path integral with, um, there's no J in there, there's no source, but there's, the free part, and then there is this inserted inside it. Now here you're treating this as a correlation function. So this could be viewed as the vacuum uh, of the free theory where we're calculating a time ordered exponential of this operator. Yeah. In your homework, you're gonna go through examples where, well, you're gonna work out the, 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 the pass integral that will make this principle clear. So this relates the free vacuum to the interacting vacuum. Good. Now, if this was abstract, let's do an example. We're gonna pick five, four, lambda five, four theory. This is our interaction term, one over four factorial, lambda is a coupling, integral of d, d, d plus one x, phi of x to the power four. I'm gonna be working with d plus one in d plus one dimensions, and I will be ignorant about the subtleties regarding whether this theory makes sense non-perturbatively, non -perturbatively, right? So some of this setup will fall apart later on, and you will have to be careful about what dimension you pick. I'll be just ignorant about that because we're doing perturbation theory. So zj over z0, formally, as these path integrals, this, these path integrals could be expanded as a path integral over phi, e to the power of i s naught of phi plus the source, 
Here, I should put this operator, but I'm just going to perturbatively expand in lambda. Is that clear? Downstairs, I have no j, but I have the same operator. I'm going to perturbatively expand in lambda. Is that good? Now, it's helpful. What is the first term? The first term is just Z naught of J. The first term here is Z naught of zero. So I can just take it out. So I can write this Z naught of J, Z naught of zero, one minus I lambda over four factorial, this expression, which is, uh, what was on the top divided by Z naught of J, this expression, which was what was on the top divided by Z naught of zero. I just factor these out. Good. Now, what I have is a function is one plus, a function that's expanded around one order by ordering some small lambda divided by another function that's been expanded order by ordering lambda. So if I want to expand the whole thing in lambda, this term is whatever it is. This in the downstairs, the expansion of one over one minus lambda is one plus lambda, right? Is that is that clear? What I'm saying is this, one minus lambda A over minus lambda B expanded to lambda is plus lambda B plus order lambda squared, right? That's all I'm doing. So here is the term up here and the term from down here comes up like this. The sign is positive. There's minus here, there's minus here. There's a relative sign between the two. So there's a relative sign between the two, right? So this term came from the expansion of the denominator. Good. I'm gonna call this term one and this term two. What is this term? This is a four point function in the presence of sources of the free theory. Good. So I'm going to write it this way. This is the free one. What is this term? This is the four point function in the absence of sources of the free theory. So I'm going to write it this way. So I wrote everything in the first order expansion in lambda in terms of the free express the free partition uh, generating functional. And in the last lecture, we worked out the free generating functional explicitly. So these expressions are explicit and we're, we're just gonna expand them. Is that good? So here is, I'm gonna try to do it as slowly as possible. And you're gonna do this in your homework, but let's keep track of terms, okay? This is the essence that what we're gonna do now repeats over the, all over the place in perturbation theory. So it's good to get it once. We're going to go focus on the first term. So what I'm going to say is something you could check explicitly by just exhaustive calculation. Just expand everything and then see cancellations. But I'm going to tell you what kind of cancellations happen. And I'm just going to focus on the first term. And that would suffice for the point I'll try to make. Let's take the first term. The first term will have three contributions in there. So this is going from this to this as perhaps three, four lines, but you could convince yourself is the case. There will be a part to this. There are, there are three contributions to this. There is a term that's delta F of X, X, no J's in there. There is a term that has one, two J's, and there's a term that has four J's. Diagrammatically, so diagrammatically, it looks like this. So let's call this point X. I'm just gonna, and, what you have is delta of x to x. Remember what delta of f was? It was a propagator between x and y, right? So if I have delta of x and x, it's this. And because I have delta of, delta of x and x squared, I'm going to draw it this way. The next term has two insertion of j's. Here are the two j's. There is a delta of fxx, here it is, and the j's and the z's are connected using common propagators. Good. 
The next term is just four insertion of J's connected to some X. This is a point X. Good. This is, I claim, the very first term. You're going to work it out your homework, but that's just the content of the first term. Now, think about this term. This term will have to drop out of the calculation. Does anyone know why? Why does this term have to drop? Because it's independent of j. The function we're looking at we're dividing it for the same function evaluated at j equals zero. If there's a term that's independent of j, must drop. This term will be canceled in a, from a term in the expansion of this. You could check that explicitly. You will check that explicitly in your homework. Good. So this is irrelevant to my calculation. And I can also physically argue for that. This term is independent of j. Why do, one, why do I want a uh, generating function? functional because I want to take derivatives with respect to J to get my correlation function. So this is just unphysical. So there are these two terms. So that was my comment number one. Comment number two is where these number six comes from. The number six could be argued by symmetry. So what do you have? You have two sources and uh, an interaction term which has four legs. That's your lambda phi four term. You will have to connect these diagrams, connect the two. For, you wanna connect one of the J's to, you have four choices. Once you made the first choice, then the second guy has three choices left, right? So you have 12 choices total, but there is no way of distinguishing between the two j's because it's jz. So you divide by two, you get six. All these factors are systematically fixed by combinatorics of your diagrams. The beauty of Feynman rules is it actually tells you these quick rules to calculate these instead of writing these integrals and numerating them all, right? So these diagrams are soup. There, there's, a, there's a very quick way of doing this. That's why path integrals are helpful because they're super quick. If you're doing th these kind of calculations using the canonical formalism, you will actually have to calculate, uh, like count them. Is that point clear? So at the first order in Lambda, these two terms are the key terms that I have. This guy drops out. I'm just gonna show you the final answer, not surprisingly. Well, there are two terms, there are term one, term two, and I included term two as well. It looks like just like this. It's basically the two terms that we had before. This is the one of the perturbation theory. You're expanding for small lambda around something, right? This is I lambda over four factorial. There's an integral over X because this point X is somewhere in the middle and could happen anywhere. This is similar to a perturbation theory we saw in quantum mechanics, where there was an interaction. Recall what the setup was. You were propagating. There was, there was a propagator. There was a, some sort of interaction happening and then propagating. This was happening at some point in space time. And you had to integrate over where, where, where it happened, because you didn't know where it happened, right? So this is analogous to that. You could, in your head, think of this as some point where the interaction happens. This is not literally true, but the structure of the integrals would be diagrammatically give you this idea, right? And then you're integrating over that. So here is the expansion, what it looks like explicitly. Why did we calculate this generating functional? Because we want to take derivatives and calculate the correlation functions. So let's do that. Good. What's the one point function? Can anyone just say it? The one point function is zero. This term has j squared. This term has j4. If you take a derivative of j squared, you get j. You have to set j equals zero. Drops out. This one has j3. Drops out. Good. Now you can already see why I picked 5, 4 theory <laughs> and not 5, 
other other interaction terms. But anyway, what's what's next? Two point function. All right, so let's calculate G two, the propagator, interacting propagator at first order in lambda. So here is your first encounter with divergences. Previously had an encounter with divergences in the vacuum energy. And I said, oh, you shift the vacuum energy, it's all good, right? But I, I said that there is some sort of principle regarding renormalization, blah, blah, blah. This is your the second time it hits you. But we'll, we're going to go through it. <clears throat> so you need to take two derivatives of the generating function and set j equals 0. This You do that, you obtain the initial free propagator, which is just a Feynman propagator, the lambda correction will look like this. Will be, sorry, why did I write it this way? Oh yeah, now that's fine. So it, it will have a factor of half minus I lambda integral over X. I already argued what this integral over X was. I del F, I del F, I del F, X, 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 Y, X, Z. Just, I'm just giving you the result of the derivatives. So diagrammatically, what this looks like is this. So this first term, we're interpreting as free propagator. So Y to Z, there is the Feynman propagator. The first order term is as you propagate at some point X, some interaction happens, but there are four legs. So this has to connect a loop. Right? This is the form of it. Now, here are the Feynman rules. Every time you have a diagram interaction, there's a factor of minus I lambda, of course, right? Every time you have a propagator, there is a factor of I delta F. So one, two, three, three propagators, Y to X, X to Z, X to X, right? All three of them. And here variable X, is on fixed because you're, you have a function of y and z alone, so you have to integrate it. Every time you have these loops, you integrate over them. This factor of half is fixed by symmetry. Do you guys know which symmetry I'm talking about? If you take this, flip it, it's the same thing, right? These legs are fixed. So this is a calculation of a two-point function, and this is the correction at order lambda. Now we're going to physically interpret this. Oh, actually, sorry. Before, before physical interpretation, I'm just going to take what I just told you and give them a name. These are called Feynman rules in real space. What is Feynman rules is that you have a complicated diagram. Somebody draws a diagram for you. Every time there is a propagator, a line, you associate to it the Feynman propagator. Every time there's a vertex, you associate to it minus I lambda d, d plus one of x. If you have uh, these crosses, these are sources. They appear in my correlation function, there were no sources, but I just included sometimes you want the sources in there. And if you have loops, you integrate over them, right? And there's a symmetry factor that you find by dividing by the symmetry of the combinatorial symmetry of your, your Feynman diagram. How, what kind of swap, how could you swap these lines? You cannot swap the external line, legs. External legs are ordered and fixed, only the, whatever you introduce in the middle, right? And these, these rules are, these, these symmetry factors are important because otherwise you overcount and you get the wrong answer. These are called Feynman rules in real space. Are there any questions? So now let's look at the correlation function in Fourier space, because if you recall, the form of the Feynman propagator was easier in Fourier space. It was just I over P squared, and there was a pole of the two-point function in the Fourier space, which was a mass. We're going to interpret this new G2, the interacting propagator, physically. So the correlation function is the free propagator plus this interaction term, and the order correction that's the order lambda squared. Let's pick this guy. If you expand this in Fourier space, what, well, I'm just going to do write it in Fourier expansion. It's minus I lambda, I delta F of zero. That has to do with the fact that you had 
uh, delta f of x, x, an integral over this guy, e to minus i, k, y minus c. These are just like d plus one uh, inner products, right? k mu. I'm just in the, uh, suppressing the index mu to make it prettier. This is what this term correction looks like. If the Fourier transform is quick, you're going to do it at home and you will um, see how this works. But the first term plus the second term in Fourier space looks like this e to the power of i, uh, th this integral, right? e to the power of i kx. This is the free propagator we saw earlier. There is a Feynman i epsilon prescription. So there is one plus a correction. The correction is i over the propagator again multiplied by delta f of zero. Right? It's just the fact that delta f of zero is here. And this is to the power of two, right? One of them I just factored out as a free propagator. I'm looking at the correction. Good. So this is algebra at this point that anyone can follow, but I'm going to interpret it. Now, at the order lambda, I can rewrite this expression in a cute way. I can rewrite this expression as a shift in m squared. Right? If this is quick, again, do it, do it at home. You'll see it. It's just like Taylor expansion. What, what happened? The pole of the propagator is shifted in the presence of interaction. The pole of the propagator was the physical mass. So the mass shifted. The mass is renormalized. So this is the first time I'm throwing this term. What does that mean? Well, your, your pole used to be at k squared equal m squared. Now it's at m, m r renormalized mass squared. The term r renormalized is incorrect here. I'm just setting the stage, okay? It's shifted. And the shift is called self-energy. Is that clear why it's called self-energy? Yeah. Now, it all looks good and nice, except that the self-energy is divergent like the vacuum energy, like everything else in perturbation theory in QFT. We will make sense of this, right? But I've already given you some hints in advance that, so how the, let's look at how it diverges. It looks like integral of D, well, this is what the expression of self-energy is. It's just the propagator at zero. And this is divergent. You'll do it in your homework. Expand, introduce a cutoff a UV cutoff and see it diverges like M to the power of D minus one. It's actually more complicated in even dimensions and odd dimensions. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. But recall the principle of renormalization. The principle of renormalization was saying that any physical observable in the infrared should be independent of the cutoff, right? So this Self-energy as we define it is not a physical observable. It's not hurting anyone. We're going to define our physical observable, infrared observable, long distance observables in this theory in such a way that this is not going to ever play a role. At the moment, you might be bothered by it, but we're going to, renormalization as a basic principle of quantum field, as a key principle of quantum field, it will take care of it and you just have to be patient, right? But the structure of how it takes care of it is actually essential. It's, it mimics this st these steps one by one, and you'll you'll see how it works, right? So that's why we're the reason we walk you through this is that the structure of renormalization is precisely the same steps. Like it just explains these things. So is the idea of so the intuition of self-energy clear? It's a shift in the pole and the propagator, interacting propagator, due to the first lambda correction. Good. Any questions? This is kind of analogous to like, uh, like if you just have a point charge and you integrate its, its like electric field to get its electric field energy, it's infinite. Yeah, it's exactly that. Well, this is a mass term I'm talking about. That's a different interaction, but yeah.
That's a different vertex. Um, there is one thing I should say that this all along I've been talking Q of T, but this self energy, these type of calculations appear in quantum mechanics as well. These are just very passive legal concepts. And there is a notion of self energy. Every time you find yourself confused, work out zero plus one dimensional Q of T. Simple examples of it. We can set up perturbation theory. These steps all exist. And renormalization is actually also a sensible thing and useful thing in quantum mechanics as well. We just never teach it. All right. But hopefully it's clear that the structure of the integrals make the divergence horrible in higher dimensions. Right? So lower dimensions are better behaved. All right. In the interest of time, I'm just going to keep pushing. But we don't have to get to the end of this um, now. So let's go to the, actually, let me pause. I, I think any questions about G2, about the interacting propagator at order lambda? What I plan for the rest of the lecture is four point function G4 at the order lambda, and then G2, two point function at order lambda squared, and then find my rules in momentum space. We're, we're going to see how far we're going to make it. So does, does the yeah. fact that the cutoff goes to m to the d plus one mean that like in one plus one dimensional, we don't have this problem? Or, or is there some caveat that I'm missing? Let, let me not get it. <laughs> let me just not get it. All right. Um, just, just look up self energy on Wikipedia or some like basic text. There's like a lot of text on this. Um, now, for to calculate the four-point function, interacting four-point function, you have to take four derivatives of the interacting, sorry, of the uh, generating function of the interacting theory and set j equals zero. Now, what happens, I'm telling you in advance, you can work it out and it's, it's neat. You will work it out and it's neat, is that recall the free theory setup. You had the Feynman propagator and your four-point function was just these cubic contractions. Now your, your two-point function has changed, is renormalized, is, has a self-energy. So, but you still discover the same structure, right? G2, an interacting particle with a new mass propagating here, 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 and here, and here. You discover the exact same terms. If this was the whole story, the effect of the interaction was just shifting the mass and the theory was still Gaussian and boring. But that's not the whole story. Importantly, there's a brand new term as G4 connected part. So these diagrams are called disconnected for clear reasons that they are disconnected, right? But this diagram is called connected. The new physics, the interacting physics is in the connected diagram. These are the content of the interactions because the rest is just like, shifting the parameters of the theory. You start with the Lagrangian with some M naught and Lambda naught and whatever. Now, if you just discover that, oh, everything is Gaussian at the end of the day, but you just have to start with a different Lambda, then that would have been simple. But this is where the interaction content is. Now I'm telling you a, a trick that you, you will read about and learn about in your homework that directly gives you the connected diagrams. The trick is what I just like in a sloppy way said in the last lecture. Instead of taking derivatives of Z with respect to J, you take derivatives of this guy, oops, of LN minus I LN of Z. And um, with respect to J. This, the analogy with uh, the analogy with um, um, classical physics is helpful here. If this is the partition function, this is the free energy. So if you take derivatives of the free energy, it actually gives you connected correlators. That If that's too quick, you'll, you'll work this out then. That's one advantage of free energy. So to see this explicitly, let's focus on the four-point function. 
So if you take the four, this, this guy and take four derivatives of it and write it in terms of four derivatives of z, you get four derivatives of z, right? I'm setting j equals zero. And then this is the extra term. This is four point function connected and disconnected. This is three pairs of disconnected two point functions. Precisely these terms. This is another beautiful thing about these path integral expressions. But so you could directly get this guy, the connected part. What is this again? It's a four point function that's time ordered minus the two point functions, the time order. These are interacting theory things and removed, right? So pairwise contract them and remove them. Is that is that clear? We are gonna, you are gonna go, I'll have to just like push you through these calculations and your homework, but the principles, are they clear? So is is the reason where we care about just getting the connected part is that like uh, the connected part is like the only genuinely new part of the interacting theory, I guess? Yeah. A theory that's Gaussian is not interacting. A theory that the diagrams are connected. So what does it mean? So far, the, the self-energy is saying that, oh, there was a particle that was propagating. You just got this mass wrong, right? But now with the correct mass, four particles that propagate, they just go through each other, right? Well, two particles that propagate, they just go through each other if there was no interaction. But interaction would require the new particles with new mass actually meeting at a point, right? Having a vertex, right? So, so this gets us the interacting diagrams correct. instead of just the free propagating diagrams. Yeah, correct. Now let's look at G4 at two loops. Uh, uh, sorry, at, at or lambda squared. At or lambda squared, right? So what does it look like? Well, there will be three diagrams. This one, two, three, four. You, are, you have to have two vertices. These, well, I'm just... There, were, there are combinatorics that I'm just suppressing. You're, you can do this and you will do this, but there will be three diagrams of this types, this type. There, you will, no matter what, you will end up with a loop because you have two lambdas. You have two of these vertices. And if you want the connected part, you're gonna end up with two loops, with a loop. So Feynman rules, let's focus on this guy. You have two vertices, so that's minus i lambda squared. There's a factor of one over two that comes from the symmetry because this diagram, the top and above bottom, you just flip it, it's a symmetry. You have um, six lines, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? There are the four external lines, so x1 to x, let's call this guy, um, x and call this guy y. So you have x1 to x, x2 to x, x3 to y, x4 to y. So these are the external legs. There is this propagator from x to y and this propagator from x to y. So x, y squared. An integral over x and y because you don't know where they happen. Similarly for these kind of things. Now, if you take this expression and expand it in Fourier space, you're going to do that in homework. You find the following thing. You find there's two pi, there, there is, you, you discover momentum conservation. Four, one, four, two, four, three, four, four will interact only the momentum is conserved. This is the Fourier transform of this bit, right? It's just four external legs. What am I what I'm describing is actually in you could you could view it this way. K1, K2, K3, K4, right? P propagating this way. Good. So there you, you obtain 
uh, conservation of momentum, you obtain uh, propagator for each external leg. There are I lambda squared. There, This momentum in the middle is not fixed, so you integrate over it. There are two propagators in the middle, and this is what they are. So just to be clear, this propagator is propagating with P. What is this propagator? What's the, what's the momentum of this guy? Conservation of momentum will tell you that this has to be, um, it has to be, what is it? K1 plus K2 minus P. Right? So hence this, I might be getting the sign wrong. Yeah, I think I'm, I got the sign wrong. Right? So on each vertex, there's momentum conservation. There's overall momentum conservation. Because this part is boring, the external leg part is super boring, we often drop it and talk about the amputated green function. That's just terminology, in case you care about it. Good. Any questions about this? So what you find is using Fourier transform, you find momentum, sorry, find my rules in momentum space. What are they? Every time four momenta meet at the point, at the vertex, an interaction vertex, there is momentum conservation. There is minus I lambda because of the interaction, and that's all that there is. That's why in momentum space, everything is simple, right? Propagator is just the uh, propagator, one over P squared plus I epsilon, right? If you have internal legs, because they're not fixed, you have to integrate over the momenta. That's where all the divergences come from, right? Momenta that just arbitrary, they exist at arbitrary high energy, similar for energy, vacuum energy, right? That we had arbitrary high moment, large momentum modes that, that had to do with the fact that the field is like continuous. And then there's symmetry factor that you will get used to the symmetry factor, how it comes in by working examples. So in summary, what we did today was first we considered interaction terms and wrote an exact equation for the generating functional of the interacting theory that we call the Schrodinger-Dyson equation. So this is the uh, generating functional of the interacting theory. This is a differential equation we'll have to satisfy. And then we said that if there is an integrated form of this, which will write a formal but exact set of equations for correlation functions relating them all together. For example, in the case of lambda phi four, this is just a set of expressions you find for correlators. Super formal. Now we took these equations and expanded them in perturbation theory of small lambda, and we discovered Feynman rules. In momentum space, they're expressed very elegantly. I repeat, when four points meet in a lambda phi four theory, there's a vertex for four point meeting, right? It's just momentum conservation and the coupling. Propagator is just a standard propagator, one over P squared plus I epsilon, minus M, there's mass, right? Internal legs are integrated over and there's always a symmetry factor. This is the end of this lecture. Are there any questions? So in summary, what we did was that we went through the path integral quantization of free scalar field in perturbation theory and discussed FIMA rules, which are rules for organizing, some sort of organization principle for um, this perturbation theory that has a million intervals, right? But there are, there's these elegant forms that you could use to organize the perturbation theory. In the next lecture, we're going to do a similar thing for fermions, for spinners. But this is the end of the, our discussion of scalar field. So if there are any questions about quantization and scalar field perturbatively, ignoring the issue of divergences, it's the right moment. Divergences is going to be the 
next part of the court, uh, this uh, before the this uh, November December, and we're going to get to it. We're going to discuss it. Any questions? So, so yeah, yeah. Just to check, like the way we would actually measure these things is like the they will relate somehow to like cross sections, right, and scattering like S matrices. Correct. Is it like could, could I interpret like G four? As, as quite literally like two particles coming in with two momenta and scattering to another not two quite. momenta or not really? Not quite. Okay. So the relation between the scatter S matrix and correlation functions is something that's called the LSC formula. So we're going to go through that, right? So the claim is that correlation functions know everything about the theory. So does the S matrix in flat space. They are analytically continue, connected to each other. The question of what are the observables of the theory is a very deep question, right? In flat space, we often say the S matrix in vacuum. If you're not in vacuum, you don't have an S matrix. So correlation functions are all you've got. Is it clear what when, when you're not in vacuum, you might not have a S matrix, like finite temperature? Is it clear why? Yeah, uh, yeah, because you don't have the initial and final space. Correct. You right? can't turn yeah. off the, you can't adiabatically turn it off. Yeah. That's all. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So I will post a poll for Fridays. We'll pick two Fridays. And November 20th, I believe, is we won't have class. So we'll pick two Fridays to make up for these. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Have a nice time. Bye.